By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic and get ready for some sweet old school magic today. We've got a red deck versus a blue deck and guess what? I'm playing the red deck. Well, it's actually more red artifacts. I'm playing Dwarven Workshop deck. Uh, with Dwarven Weaponsmiths in it. It's it's a deck that I really like. It's a Tron deck, and I'm looking forward to, to test it against uh, Dan today. Dan is a player from Denmark, and he's brought a Mono Blue Merfolk deck to the table. And uh, yeah, this is going to be fireworks today. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to play this match. Now, before I start with the deck decks of both of these decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to skip that section of the video, go straight to the games. I know some of you prefer to do that. The easiest way to do that is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there, it'll take you straight to the action. And in the description below, you can also find more information about the rule set if you're into that kind of thing. Okay, then I'm going to continue here with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of Dan. Let's take a look at his Merfolk Brew. And here we see the deck of Dan. Well, this is really your Merfolk deck, isn't it? We see Merfolk of the Pearl Trident, we see four Lord of Atlantises, also for Flying Man and of course for Surrender Befried. So this is a very aggressive deck, right? He is probably going to be able to play a turn one Flying Man or a Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Turn two, you know, we can see a Lord of Atlantis. He also plays with Mishra's Factories. Surrender Befried is a super aggro card. It's a 3-4 flyer for three. So this is just a good deck, you know. This is actually also a nice deck if you're looking to build something budget, this is also a good deck to build because a lot of these cards are available as reprints. I guess the Psionic Blast is kind of expensive in here. And of course, the power cards here, I see an Ancestral Recall, uh, Library of Alexandria, Chaos Orb, Mana Drain. Those cards are very expensive. Mox uh, Sapphire, of course. But you know what? You can build this deck in budget version without those cards and it's still a good deck. You can still win a lot of games. I mean, this deck actually is looking very fierce. But the card I'm the most afraid of in this deck, apart from just the tempo that is going to overwhelm me because it's just going too fast. But the card I'm worried about here is Energy Flux. Energy Flux is an enchantment from Antiquities, one blue and two to cast. And it gives all the artifacts in play an upkeep cost of two. And if you can't pay it, the artifact gets destroyed. Now remember, I'm playing a deck. Well, actually, you don't know yet, but I can tell you now. I'm playing a deck with all the Moxen and it's very artifact heavy. So if I don't have Tron and this energy flux hits the board, it is super bad news for me. So I just got to keep my fingers crossed and, you know, and hope that Dan is not able to find the energy flux uh, in this game or at least not find it early in the game. I think it's going to be pretty tough. Another card that I'm not really looking forward uh, to uh, playing against is the, uh, the Boomerang. The Boomerang is too blue and you can return target permanent to its owner's hand. Now, I think the Boomerang is really good as a tempo play. Of course, you can also use it to, for example, save your own creature or send a creature of, of the opponent back. But it's also really good earlier on in the game where you just send the land back to hand and that's kind of going to set an opponent back, you know, and it's going to, because you're setting your opponent back, you're setting yourself, giving yourself a tempo advantage. That's what I'm trying to say here. Anyway, Boomerang, I think, is one of those cards that's a little bit underestimated, but I think it's really, really good. And yes, the two blue is sometimes a problem, but I understand that Dan is picking it here over on Summon. You know, I get that. Um, so this is the deck of Dan. Now let's take a look at my deck, the Dwarven Workshop. And here we see my deck, the Dwarven Workshop. Now the Dwarven Workshop is actually built around the Dwarven Weaponsmith. That was kind of my starting point. I'm really a big fan of the art of Dwarven Weaponsmith. And it also does something unique because it's a 1-1 one -one creature for 1 red and 1 from the Antiquities. I can tap it and then I can sacrifice an artifact and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. So a counter. And that's what makes it so special. Unfortunately, I can only activate this ability during the upkeep. So that is just so unfortunate. I wish this card would work more like a Sage of Latinam, that I could always activate it. But okay, it is what it is. I can only use it during my upkeep. So what I want to do is I've decided to play with a lot of cards, creatures that uh, come into play with plus one, plus one counters on them. For example, Tetravus, it's a 4-4 four, four flyer. Well, actually a 1-1 one, one flyer for six mana, but it comes into play with three plus one, plus one counters. So that makes it a 4-4. Four, four. And then during my upkeep, I can take those counters off or put them back on again. 
and I can make a uh, 1-1 one, one little flyers out of them. So how cool would it be if I can use my Dwarven uh, Weaponsmith to, for example, sacrifice one of my Moxen, I'm playing with all five the Moxen in, in this deck, sacrifice one of my Moxen to put a plus one plus one counter on my Tetravis, making it a 5-5, five, five, and then I can take the next turn. I know it takes a long time, but still, it's a dream, right? It's This, is, this deck is really about the dream. So then the next turn, I can take the four counters off and have four 1-1 one, one flyers. How cool is that? And you can do basically the same thing with the Clockwork Avian because that comes in with four plus one plus O counters. So again, I can make, give an extra counter. I can make it a five five flyer. It's just kind of fun. And it also works really well with Triskelion because Triskelion is six to cast. Again, it's a one one creature, but it comes into play with three plus one plus one counters. And then you can shoot those counters off the trike, right? Deal one damage to any target. And uh, you know, it comes into play with three counters, but of course with Dwarven Weaponsmith, I'm hoping to put more counters on the creature. Now, um, because all these creatures are very heavy in their casting cost, I thought, you know what, let's just play with Tron. Combine Tron with Red. Uh, Tron, of course, is a combination where if you have Urza's Tower, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Power Plant, the lands tap for more mana. The Tower taps for three. The, the Power Plant and the Mine tap for two each. But you have to have all three of those different cards on the battlefield. If you only have one, they only tap for one mana. So it's not that special and it's a colorless mana as well. But it's still not too bad because I'm playing with so many artifacts. So I don't really mind um, if I don't have Tron. But obviously the deck is kind of built around having Tron. That is the dream. So I am uh, playing with uh, two Jam Day Tomes in this deck as well. Because when you play with so many mana, you want to do something with your mana if you don't have the cards that you're looking for. So you want to kind of dig for those cards with your uh, Jam Day Tome. And then I'm also playing with, on this picture actually you only see one Taunus's Coffin, but I made a change in the deck. I was able to acquire a second Taunus's Coffin. So I'm now playing with two Taunus's Coffins and I'm taking out the Glasses of Urza. Now Taunus's Coffin is a sick combo piece in this deck. So Taunus's Coffin is, is quite an interesting card. It's four to cast for an artifact from the Antiquities expansion. And it reads three and tap, exile target creature and all auras attached to it. Note the number and kind of counters that were on that creature. When Taunus's Coffin leaves the battlefield or becomes untapped, return that exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control tapped with the noted number and kind of counters on it. If you do, return the other exiled cards to the battlefield under their owner's control attached to the permanent. So that means that all the auras, they stay attached, but also the counters stay on it. And, and this is the cool thing. When you put, for example, a Triskelion in the Taunus's Coffin, and then you untap the Taunus's Coffin the next turn. The Trike comes in, yes, tapped, with the counters it had when it went in the box. But also, the Enter the Battlefield effect trigger again. Because it was exiled, it was out of the battlefield. And then it comes back into the battlefield. So that means, if I have a Triskelion in there, it comes back as a 7-7. Seven, seven, because it comes back again with three extra counters on it, right? Can you still follow? If I do that with Clockwork Avian, I think that's going to be really cool. If I can do it with Clockwork Avian. Because... You don't see that a lot. Anyway, put the Clockwork Avian in as a 4-4. Then it comes back with 4 plus 1 plus 0 counters extra on it. So it's an 8-4 flyer. Now, unfortunately, they do come back tapped. So again, I got to wait a whole turn before I can untap and attack with it. It is not perfect. But of course, the cool thing with the Triskelion is that I can just take the counters off whenever. So even if the creature tapped, I can still ping and deal damage with those counters, which makes it really good. But the dream is really to have Taunus' Coffin, to have Dwarven Weaponsmith, to just have all these, you know, crazy synergies going on. That's what I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Now, the big problem here, of course, is the speed of my opponent's deck. And of course, the energy fluxes I mentioned. So hopefully Dan is going to be kind of nice for me. He's going to give me time. Hopefully I can find my bolts. I think bolts are going to be really important early on. Uh, and, and, and yeah, let's just hope I manage, you know. I've, I've got some weapons in this deck to kind of stop the early pressure. You know, maybe I can find an Icy, I can ramp up a little bit with my Moxen. You know, that's that's the dream. And then, then hopefully I can start doing a lot of crazy counter shenanigans. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed here for this match. Anyway, we've seen the deck of Dan. This is my deck. Let's go to the match. Game number one. Here we go. Dan is on the play. He's playing Merfolk. Oh, look at that library of Alexandria. I am playing with Blood Moon, though, so hopefully I can find it early. I'm playing with a red Tron deck. And uh, yeah, I just got to hope for the best here. I mean, that library is a problem. Starting here with a Mox Sapphire and a Mistress Factory. So I'll be able to put a little bit of pressure here on Dan. Dan is now going to go to seven. Probably going to draw a card. Exactly. 
going to go up to eight. But yeah, this is not a great start for me. Great start for Dan. Playing a blue, is he going to be able to cast something? Playing a Merfolk of the Pearl Trident, so just a 1-1. One, one. So I'm probably going to attack here. I think when you're facing a Library of Alexandria and you don't have an answer for it, the best thing to do is just put pressure on your opponent, making it hard for him to keep uh, the, the cards on hand. So attacking here with the 2-2. Two, two. Unfortunately, I don't have a Blood Moon, I guess, or else I would have played it. Blood Moon, of course, uh, one red and two. I'm playing two main. It's an enchantment from the dark, and it turns all the non-basic lands into mountains, so it would turn that Library of Alexandria into a mountain. Also my factory, but, I mean, that's a price I'm definitely willing to pay. So drawing an extra card again, and attacking here with the tri a Pearl Trident, so putting me on 19. The question is, is he going to play out a card here? I believe he's got seven in hand now. Or does he want to keep two blue open for counter magic? Passing the turn. Let's see what I can do. There is a strip mine. Okay, I found a strip mine. I think that's really good for the game, actually. So he got two extra cards from the Library of Alexandria, and I'm not going to strip. I'm actually thinking about stripping a blue source. Interesting. I should really strip the Library of Alexandria here. What am I thinking? Oh, there's a boomerang. Oh, so I want to strip it. In response, Dan is playing a boomerang on the Library of Alexandria. Oh, oh that's brilliant. I've never, this is a first on the channel. What a great move by Dan. So actually what happens now is my strip mine fizzles because the target is no longer there. So I'm losing a strip mine. I'm losing a land drop. And my opponent still has a Library of Alexandria. This is horrible. Of course, I'm just going to attack him now, but wow, this is such a setback for me. This is so bad. I believe he's got nine cards in hand now. No, of course, because he played the boomerang, so he's got eight in hand. So he's going to play this. And he's going to use it probably exactly. Go back up to eight. And then if he can also find like a Lord of Atlantis. Oh man, this is so bad. I think I'll probably lost the game here with this moment. Because playing against an active library is super difficult against any deck, but especially dance, you know, aggressive deck. And, you know, on top of that, I'm behind a land drop as well. Well, I guess he unsummoned, so we're kind of the same in that department. But anyway, it's really, really bad for me. I really need a Blood Moon ASAP. Tapping three. There's an Energy Flux. Oh, no. Energy Flux means I got to pay two during my upkeep. So I got it per artifact. So I got to pay two for that Mox. Or else I'm going to lose it. Oh, this is a horrible game one. I need a miracle here. What I can do now is at least use the mana from my Sapphire to activate the factory. I guess I'm going to keep the Sapphire around, it seems. Interesting choice. Because I don't really need blue mana in my deck anyway. Playing a mountain. I can again attack him for two. I mean, he's on 16. can put him on 14. That's something. It looks like I'm really in the tank here, trying to find a way out of this. I think the boomerang play was just so brilliant. And this shows you how good boomerang is. I mean, it's so diverse. So I'm really, really taking my time here, but I think if I have nothing to play out, I should just attack for two. Exactly. Like, maybe I was considering wanting to keep a block open, but I, I don't think I should. I just got to try to put the pressure on. I'm playing with some direct damage in the deck. You know, maybe I can get Dan low enough and start throwing some bolts. Uh, I mean, chances are slim, but you got to play towards your outs. There's the attack for one. I'm going to drop to 17. I mean, at least Dan is not able to put a lot of pressure on the board. I believe he's got eight cards in hand now again. It looks like he's a little bit stuck here. And is he going to miss a land drop? That would be good news for me. Tapping three. Are we going to see a surrender? Yep, yeah, there's the surrender. Free the three, four flyer. And uh, that's, of course, a problem for me here. I cannot bolt it. I don't have enough mana to play my bigger creatures. I'm probably going to lose my mox here because of the energy flux. 
looks like maybe Dan wants to do something else. Nope, he's just passing the turn. Okay, so I'm going to untap. And now i got to decide if I want to keep the Mox. Yeah, I'm going to let the Mox die here. I mean, if I have four mana, I can start playing like Icy Manipulator. Like an Icy would be nice. Unfortunately, then I cannot use it. But okay, there's an Urza's Tower. If I can just get Tron, that would be perfect. Tapping three. Okay, there's a Blood Moon. There's a Blood Moon. Okay, it's a little late. It's a little late, but at least it stops the uh, the Library of Alexandria. Of course, the problem here for me is that I am turning my own non-basic lands into mountains as well. So the whole Tron plan is kind of out of the window. But I mean, an active Loa is, is way more scary. And my deck can really function without Tron as well. So Dan here, of course, taking a damage from the Surrendip. Look at that, playing a Mox. Interesting. Because he's got to pay taxes for the Mox. There's a Lord of Atlantis. This is bad news. He wants to turn them sideways. It looks like I want to do something. The Lightning Bolt, probably on the Lord of Atlantis. So that means I take a damage less at least. Still going to take four. Dropping to 13 here. And there's a Flying Man. Okay, now the Mox actually makes sense because he, he can keep two blue open to counter. So this is a, this is a good move by Dan. And this is going to be a problem for me. I mean, he can really hit me pretty hard next turn. Tapping three. Oh, okay. Taking a risk here. But at least, I mean, what happens now is all our mana, uh, because of the mana flare, or, or all our mana uh, tap for doubles. All our lands tap for an extra mana, I should say. So if I tap my mountain, I'm going to get two lands. If I tap the... Oh, look at this. It's the end of the line, right? Double Psionic Blast in response. <sighs> I mean... Mana Flare, it's a risky card. And here you can see why it's a risky card. But again, I'm just playing towards my outs. I'm just trying to do whatever I can. You know, I'll probably have a Fireball in hand. Anyway, I'm going to die right now. I'm on five. He can attack me here for four or five. It's the end of the line in game number one. But, I mean, I was behind from the start with that Library of Alexandria. That was just horrible for me. And I think that boomerang play was was the big moment here in this game one. Maybe he's down. Maybe he doesn't want to attack. Okay, he is attacking. If I have a bolt, though. Oh, yeah, there's the fireball. Exactly. So I had a fireball in hand. So pointing out the mana flare, explaining why I was doing what I was doing. But yeah, that response with double psionic blast, that was hilarious, Dan. Anyway, um, dead. Game number one is going to dance merfolk here. And let's uh, shuffle up. Dive into our sideboards and we'll catch back up with you in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So at least now I'm on the play. Let's just hope then that you don't find your Library of Alexandria again. So six in hand, pass turn. There's a turn one play, a Flying Man. Do I have a Bolt? If I have one, I think it's a good, good thing to play. Exactly, there's the Bolt. I mean, the thing is if you wait and you start regretting it, and yes, I know, maybe I should keep the bolts for um, for the Lord of Atlantis, but I think, you know, before you know it, the Flying Man has dealt like three, four points of damage. Just bolt it, get it out of the way. There's a factory. So five cards in hand, it seems. And a pass turn. So let's see if Dan can put some more creatures on the board. Remember, he's playing with a full playset of Flying Man, Murfolk of the Pearl Trident, also with four Lord of Atlantises. So he's got a lot of options that turn two. Just passing though, two blue open does mean he has access to counter magic. I'm gonna attack here. Are we gonna see a boomerang? There's the boomerang, yeah, exactly. I was thinking like, should I do this? Is this a mistake? I mean, I'm going to six. And the big problem here is this is a tempo play by Dan, right? I mean, he's setting me back a land drop. So this is really good work from Dan. That boomerang is really impressing me. And maybe I got a little bit too greedy with the attack here. I mean, I was thinking he's playing blue, two blue open. You know, you don't have disenchant, no shatter, no crumble. He doesn't have psionic blast yet because he needs three for that. But I forgot about the boomerang. That was a really good play by Dan. And he is playing a Mishra's Factory here. Tapping three. Uh-oh, there is a Surrender Befreet. Oh, this is not going good for me. Surrender Befreet, three, four, flyer. Okay, this is good. Mishra's Workshop. 
and a Mox Emerald, so this is really good. So the Mistress Workshop taps for three mana, but I can only use it to cast Artifact. So this means I've got six mana now, which is great in my deck. There is a Triskelion. Okay, this, now it's changing. This is great. So now I've got a 4-4. Four, four. Passing the turn to Dan. Dan taking a damage, of course. Ah, and I'm going to use my Trike Arms. Shout out to the Rhineland Adventures for sending over these Trike Arms. They're awesome, guys. Thank you so much. And now let's just hope that it lives long enough. Usually when I put the arms on, somebody starts destroying my trike. It's very annoying. But anyway, the arms are on here. Let's see what Dan's going to do. I'm kind of expecting him to just attack with the flyer. Exactly. Going to put me here on 17. There is a maze of it. Oh, that is so annoying. That is really good because, of course, I wanted to attack here with the uh, Triskelion. But that's not going to happen with that maze. I'm going to play a factory for, my, uh, for myself. Let's see what I can do. That maze is annoying. Tapping four. Maybe an icy manipulator. That would be quite nice. Untapping here again. Tapping three instead. What am I going to do? Oh, I am playing a blood moon. That's an interesting move because, of course, I'm changing my own... A uh, workshop here into a mountain. Interesting decision, but the Maze of If and Factory on the side of Dan are also turned into mountains. And now I can, of course, attack with the Trike, deal four points of damage. But this is an interesting move because that workshop is really good in my deck because I'm playing with so many uh, artifacts with a high casting cost, you know, JM de Tome, Icy Manipulator, Tetravis. And the workshop really helps me to cast them. Anyway, we see Dan attacking here and playing a flying man. Kind of inviting me to use a counter to kill the flying man. Playing another land. So now I've got six mana. Okay, that's, that's an important number for me. Attacking here with the 4-4. Four, four. Is Dan going to jump or is he going to take the damage? He would go to 10. The problem here for Dan, of course, is like a card like Boomerang is really bad against Strike. Like he could Boomerang it and not take damage, but then it can take the counters off in response. And when I recast it, I have the counters again. Ooh, this is really bad news for Dan. This Icy Manipulator is great. Because I can tap down a Surrender here. There's a Boomerang, though, on the Icy Manipulator, probably, but then in response, yeah, I can tap it, that doesn't matter. No, I'm just going to take it back here. I cannot recast it. So that means that Dan can at least attack one more turn with the Surrendip. And maybe he's got a counter spell in hand, or maybe he's going to draw into one, because I'm sure if he had it in hand, he would have countered the Icy. Maybe he's going to draw in one, who knows. Anyway, he's going to take a damage, so he's going to drop to nine. Yeah, he already took the damage there. So now he can attack for four. He can put me on 10. Now, I have to keep in mind those Psionic Blasts. You could see that in game one. I mean, double Psionic Blast, I went from, from eight to zero. So actually, I was on 13. I went to five, and then he killed me. But anyway, the Psionic Blast, I have to keep that in mind when taking damage. And Dan really kind of also stuck thinking, what should I do here? If I can attack next turn, I can put him on five. Remember, I can take the trike counter, so I'll deal an additional three points of damage. He would be on two if I then have a trike in hand. But I think this is a good decision by Dan. You got to play towards your outs. I'm on 14. Put me on 10. You know, if he survives another turn, he can put me on, on six. If he then has a double side blast, you know, then he can, then he can win it. It's as simple as that. There's some more pressure on the board here. And a chump blocker for the Triskelion. That is really good. So the question for me is here, am I going to kill the Pearl Trident so that I can deal three points of damage, put him on six? That is what I'm going to do. Ooh, but this is a close match, though. I'm not there yet. Remember, Dan can put me on six next turn. And maybe then, if he has a double Cyblast, he could kill me. First attacking Dan, putting him on six. 
He's going to drop to five, of course, because of that Serendip. Oh, do I have... I got a Fireball. Yeah, I think I think that's enough. I can play a Fireball for four. Put him on two. I think it's a Fireball for four, so I'm going to put him on two. And then I can kill him with the Trike Arms. Exactly. So I can ping him to death. And that means it is a 1-1. One, one, and I'm happy with that because it means we are going to game number three. Game number three, here we go. So it's 1-1. One, one. Who's going to win this match? Is it going to be Dan from Denmark? And look at that, he's taking a mulligan. Or is it going to be Timmy from the Netherlands? And we see uh, Dan is a member, by the way, of the Herloon Heroes. That is his playgroup. So shout out to the Herloon Heroes. Dan putting a card here on the bottom, so he took a mull. He is on the play, I, I guess. Maybe I'm still thinking if I want to keep. I guess I'm keeping because Dan is picking up his cards and I'm picking up my cards. So let's get this party started. Game number three here, the decisive game, 1-1. One, one. Tapping the island, there is a flying man. The 1-1 one, one flyer from Arabian Nights. It's always funny because it's uh, spelled men with an E, so it's plural, but it's actually only one man on the picture. So it should be flying man with an A, but... That's always interesting, right? Anyway, playing a Candelabra of Tanis. So Candelabra of Tanis is quite cool if I can have Tron. Because if I have Tron active, I can make a lot of mana with my Candelabra of Tanis. That's another dream that's in the deck. Anyway, there's a Lord of Atlantis by Dan. So Dan's just putting a lot of pressure on. Next turn, he can hit me for three. I do, of course, have the Mishra's Factory. So if I can find a land here. Ooh, I'm going to tap. I'm going to do something else. Tapping two here. Haven't found any ramp. Okay, there is a Chaos Orb. Again, this is this is why I'm kind of okay with playing against blue. I don't have to worry about Disenchant or Crumble or, you know, Shatter. So I, I'm fine with playing uh, a Chaos Orb now without me being able to ac actually activate it. Usually against decks that have artifact removal. Ooh, there we see an Ancestral Recall by Dan. That is good for him. But what I wanted to say is when my opponent's playing with artifact removal, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not just gonna, I'm only gonna play it if I can activate it the same turn. But for now, this was a perfect moment for me, also because Dan, of course, was stepped out. He couldn't counter. I mean, I guess I guess he can still boomerang the Chaos Orb. That would be funny. Anyway, let's see what Dan's gonna do playing another island. Looks like he's gonna hit me for three here. It's gonna put me on 16. He's got two blue open. And he's gonna pass the turn. I wonder if I'm going to use the orb here. Let's first see if I can have my land drop. Finding a mountain. The thing is, do you really want to flip on, for example, Lord of Atlantis when you also play with lightning bolts in deck? I think for me, the Urnims are a much bigger threat. Also considering I'm not drawing into any Moxen or any way to kind of ramp up. So my bigger creatures, I got to wait probably until turn six before I can play them. And I'm probably dead already by that time. So it looks like I'm just going to pass here. Five cards in hand. I mean, if if I pass, I keep, I keep my options open. You know, I have enough mana to activate my factory. I got enough mana to use my Chaos Orb. So yeah, I kind of understand. I got mana open for a pos possible Lightning Bolt. And of course, Dan is just going to attack, right? You're first going to attack, and then in your second main, you can still play stuff out. Unless, of course, you have, um, for example... Okay, look at this. He is attacking. I'm going to activate my factory. There's a boomerang on the factory. In response, I'm going to tap one red. What am I going to do here? Do I have a Bolt? Oh, I have a Red Elemental Blast from the sideboard, of course. Taking care of business, Red Elemental Blast against the Boomerang. Yeah, playing it against the Boomerang so I can block the Lord of Atlantis and pump to three. Then he's going to lose the Lord. I'm going to take one damage. And there is a Mishra's Factory from Dan. Wow, this was a really important moment for me in the game that I was able to kind of counter that boomerang. Because I was then able to kill. Look at this. Strip mine stripping that Mishra's Factory. 
attacking here. And now I can do something really cool with the Candelabra of Tannis, actually. I can use the Candelabra of Tannis, exactly, to untap my factory, pump my factory, and deal three points of damage instead of two. Yeah! These are like these little achievements that I've built into my deck, so I'm just really happy to see those achievements unlocked. Anyway, going back to Dan here, and I still have that Chaos Orb on the board, so I'm feeling pretty good, actually. Even if Dan can find a Surrendip, which is a problem for me, I can just simply flip the, uh, the Chaos Orb. He's going to attack me first here, put me on 14, play a Mirrorfolk of the Pearl Trident. Ooh, there's a Maze. That is annoying. We saw that maze earlier in the in this match. I mean, I wish I could just kind of ramp up and play a trike, because that would be great against the board of Dan. So I believe that's an Urza's mine, right? So then I have a power plant and a mine. So if they can find a tower, I can have Tron. Now this is tough. Do I want to use the flip on the maze of it? I'm not quite sure. I mean, if I flip on the maze, the next turn he plays a Surrendip, I feel so stupid. So it's it's hard to make a decision here. Look at that, tapping four. I'm going to do something else. Icy Manipulator. Okay, that's a move. So the next turn I can tap down the maze. There's a Boomerang. Oh, those Boomerangs are good. Again, setting me back. And Dan drawing his card for turn. He can swing in for two. Put me on 12. It's really interesting, right, to see these different strategies where, where Dan is really on tempo aggro. I'm more on the control route, but at the same time, I'm also trying to get my damage in. Ooh, this is a really good play here because that's going to pump up the Pearl Trident, taking three damage, and I'm going to go to 11. What am I going to do here? I think at a certain point I have to start using that Chaos Orb. Okay, finding another land. That's good news because then I can play my Icy and use my Icy. That's something. Looks like I'm going to use the Chaos Orb here. Probably going to flip on the Lord of Atlantis. And it's a hit. So that is a good flip. Taking care of the Lord. Oh, and Fireball. I actually have enough to kill both 1-1s one here with a Fireball. That's a nice 2-for-1. So out of nowhere, I've wiped Dan's board. Dan's back to uh, to ground zero. I've got three cards in hand. Now, remember, one of those cards is an Icy. So next turn, I can play the Icy, tap down the Maze. But then I won't have enough mana to activate my factory. So probably not going to do that. But still, I can play... The Icy, which is a great card. Dan only having two cards in hand now. That one card over there, the card he's just drawn. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank here. What is he going to do? I mean, I'm on 11. Dan's still on 17. It's not too bad. I mean, Dan's playing with four Psyblasts. I'm just going to keep repeating that. Those Psyblasts are scary. Looks like he's kind of doubting what to do. Okay, Phantasmal Terrain. Okay, he was thinking, what land should I take? I think in this case, yeah, I would I would also take the threat. Because, yeah, I, I kind of get Tron later in the game, but... I mean... The, the threat right now is the factory. I, I get it. So, that Phantasmal Terrain. The cool thing about Phantasmal Terrain is, I remember being a young Timmy, and I used to think that Phantasmal Terrain turned every island, every land into an island... But actually, you can choose the basic land type. So it doesn't have to be an island. It can be a swamp, a forest, a plains, a mountain, or an island. But it doesn't have to be an island. You can choose. Anyway, I've got an island now. Okay, there is a factory. Probably going to tap four here to replay. Oh, a Jam Day Tome. I was expecting to replay the Icy Manipulator playing a Jam Day Tome instead. Two cards in hand now. And also two cards for Dan. Going through his graveyard. Is there a recall in his deck? 
I mean, he's got ancestral recall in the graveyard, so if he's drawn into a recall, but I'm not, I can't remember if there was a recall in his list. Looks like he's passing the turn here, untapping. Playing another land. So it, it, this is quite good for me, right? When you're playing against an aggressive deck like Merfolks and there's a standstill, it's, it's a good thing. Also because I have to book, of course. So now I've got enough mana to tap down the maze, exactly. And then I can swing in with the factory. Going to swing in for two here. Going to put Dan on 15. I'm just now thinking maybe I sh well, then I wouldn't have had enough mana to also activate the factory. No, okay. Okay, I, w I was thinking maybe it would have been better to play the IC before the book and then play the book. But it actually doesn't matter. So he's got a factory now on the side of Dan. But he cannot pump the factory yet because it's got summoning sickness. So what I can do here is I can tap down the maze. Oh, I'm just passing turn. What I could have done is tap down the maze Attack with the factory. If he blocks, untap my factory, pump it, uh, pump my own factory. So then I would win that battle. So I think Dan wouldn't have blocked actually. So I'm kind of letting go uh, some damage. Uh, I'm missing some damage here. That's what I'm trying to say. I could have dealt three points of damage extra. So now I'm tapping down the factory of Dan. And I'm drawing an extra card. So that's a lot of value for me here on the end step of Dan. That's of course a problem for him. I can now use... The icy tap down the maze, attack him, untap him with the candelabra, deal three points of damage. Ooh, playing another icy. This is really bad news here for, for Dan. Counterspell, okay, this is really important. I think this counterspell is really important. Taking care of the icy manipulator. I mean, I should still just tap down the maze here and attack. Or do I want to protect my life total? That's, of course, a choice as well. Do you say, okay, I just don't want to have an attack. What I, actually, there are quite a lot of options here. What I can do as well, it looks like I'm just passing the turn, but I think what I should do is tap the maze, attack with the factory, not use my Candelabra of Tannis. Then if he attacks with the factory, I can untap my factory with Candelabra of Tannis and it can pump itself. So that way I can still deal two points of damage. So drawing an extra card here on end step and tapping the maze. I mean, this GM Day Tome is an absolute all-star right now in the game because there's this standstill, but I'm drawing twice as many cards as, as Dan, and that's a big problem for Dan. And I think eventually that'll probably give me the victory. There's a maze of my own. Tapping five mana here. Okay, there's a Clockwork Avian. So this is a 4-4 flyer from Antiquities. Comes into play with four plus one plus oh counters. And when it attacks or blocks, it loses one of those counters at the end of that phase. So at the end of combat. So it still deals the damage, but then a counter goes off. And during my upkeep, I can choose to put a counter back on or multiple counters back on. But here's the catch. It then um, taps itself. So then I lose the Avian for a turn. It kind of goes to the repair shop, you could say. There's another mace for Dan. Oh, that's annoying. I guess what I can do is tap one mace now on end step of Dan. Tap another one. So tapping a mace, taking on my turn. Don't have enough mana to also draw a card here. I can now tap the other mace. It looks like I've got three power plants, by the way. I think they're all power plants. There's not a mine in there. I thought I had a mine in the plant, but there are three power plants. Anyway, tapping down his other maze and attacking now. Again, I think I can also attack with the factory here. I guess I don't want to trade it for Dan's factory, but... I mean, I could, I, I could have done it. There's a Lord of Atlantis. If he can find another Lord, because remember, because of the Phantasmal Terrain, I have an island. So if he can find another Lord, the Lords give each other Island Walk, it would be unblockable. And now I'm going to keep my Clockwork Avian tapped to put another counter on it because I cannot attack with it anyway. Then I'm going to draw for turn. I mean, if Dan can find the Lord of Atlantis, that is actually really scary. Oh, look at that. Another Clockwork Avian. There's a Mana Drain, though. And oh, Red Elemental Blast. I mean, those Red Elemental Blasts are really making a difference in this match. 
and I know how it feels, Dan, because you know my my favorite deck, Timmy Spellbook, is Mono Blue, so I know I know what it feels like. Anyway, I've got his second Clockwork Avian on the board, and I can now tap down the maze. Next turn, tap down the other maze. Then I can attack him for eight. Put him on three. And Dan really... Dan needs luck. And he's not finding luck. He's actually unlucky with me finding the red, uh, red Elemental Blasts. Tapping down the other maze. And now I can attack him here for eight. Gonna put him on three, and then after combat, I'm gonna lose the counters. One on each. Oh, look at that, I'm also activating the factory, it seems. Attacking with that as well, wow. That is pretty aggressive. There's an activation. I'm gonna untap my factory, pump it. So I guess we're gonna trade. Interesting choice here. I do, of course, have the maze to stop the uh, the Lord of Atlantis. There's a disintegrate. That's the end of the line. Okay, wow, winning this. This feels good. I'm happy. I think Red Elemental Blast was the game changer here. I mean, that really, that saved me twice. But also, I was drawing quite well. Anyway, thank you, Dan, for this great match. I really had a lot of fun. And for me, the play, actually, of this match wasn't in my deck, it was your deck. It was that boomerang on uh, the Library of Alexandria in game one. That was just absolutely phenomenal. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that. So that was just, uh, just amazing. Again, thank you, Dan, for this match. Here we can see Dan's Merfolk deck. It is really cool. I like Merfolk. Like I said, you can build a pretty pretty okay budget Merfolk uh, uh, brew. There's actually a, a video about that on my channel where I play with a budget Merfolk deck. It's a, it's a pretty good deck. I've taken it to a tournament as well. It, it wins some matches. It's kind of nice. Anyway, uh, before you go, I'd like to ask you to first uh, take a moment to like, subscribe. No, to like, to comment, and share. That's what I want to say first. <laughs> anyway... Uh, please do that. It's all uh, free to do and it really helps my channel move forward. And if you're not a subscriber yet, please hit that subscribe button and ring the bell. Okay, now that that is out of the way, there's one last thing that I would like to share with you and that is my Patreon page because I have a Patreon program and you can find it on patreon.com slash timmytalks. And the cool thing is when you go there, you can find out how you can support Timmy Talks financially. So if you enjoy the content that I make, please consider becoming a sponsor of the show. It already starts with $1 a month and for that dollar, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. Your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video. And of course, you can join the Timmy Talks online events. So please take a moment to go to patreon.com slash Timmy Talks and consider becoming a patron. Thank you and see you next time. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Zeke!